welcome back to the layout once again. Today we're going to talk about signaling for your model railroad. I've tried two different kinds of signal systems on the layout so far, and while we're mainly going to cover the Atlas system, let's start by discussing the three main systems I've come across, and welcome to Model Railroading Made Simple. If you're like me, you want to have some realistic signaling on your layout, or you've been talked into it by your friends. We'll assume you already know the basics of how and why signals do what they do, and the difference between CTC and ABS signaling. We'll mostly be talking about ABS signaling in this segment. We'll be using the three types of common North American signals, and for most signal systems, including the Atlas one, you can mix and match just about any manufacturer and type. There's the Type G, the modern hooded, and the Southern Pacific target style, which has three LEDs, red, yellow, and green, on the same lens. We won't go into flashing aspects in this video. However, most of the systems I'm aware of can accommodate this if desired. You also have two signal head variants of the three types mentioned for diverging control points. The lower signal is for the siding, and the top signal is for the main. Hence, red over a green is a diverging clear, as the tracks diverge and go into the siding. First up is signal systems that use Digitrax LocoNet as the primary way of communication. If you've got a Digitrax system, then you probably already have LocoNet and should seriously consider going that route for your signaling. Digitrax and other manufacturers make components and parts that are designed to work with LocoNet. However, if you're using NCE, MRC, or another DCC system, you would need to buy a Digitrax DCC system and install that throughout your layout in tandem with your existing system in order to have the LocoNet run your signals. For folks on NCE like me, the idea of buying a whole other DCC system just to run signals with all of its own wiring and power needs is a negative. That said, it's a very powerful system that has been implemented on the vast majority of clubs and layouts that do have signal systems. Most of those clubs seem to have members that are comfortable with the steep learning curve for Digitrax products. Having an NCE DCC system, I opted to try something a little less confounding for my graphic arts background. I first tried the block animator by Logic Rail Technologies. As with Digitrax, there are pluses and minuses to this system. For one, it uses either photovoltaic or infrared detectors you embed in the tracks to detect a train passing over them. When the sensor is covered by a train, the board displays the appropriate signal. The big problem here is the sensor must be covered, so if a train is shorter than the block it occupies, the sensor will report the block as clear. There's a delay before the signal turns back to green, but I never found it was enough time to accurately display if my large blocks were really clear or not. Additionally, I was never able to interlock this system with any other blocks or switches. To give you an example, when you have a block of track and a switch, there are two factors that determine if a signal is red or green. If the upcoming block is clear, the signal should display a green aspect. If the switch is aligned correctly for the route, the signal should also be green. However, if any one of these is not true, the signal must be red. That means the signal system must be interlocked with the switch so that the switch position can override a green signal if the switch is not thrown correctly. My switches are powered by tortoises, but there are several competitors out there that do just fine. The problem with logic rail is I could never get the tortoise to interface with the board, leading to cases where both a siding and a main would show as green, which is impossible in the real world. We'll come back to this concept in a little bit. So for two main reasons, I decided to abandon the logic rail system, the lack of true detection with the infrared sensors, and lack of interlocking ability with the switches. If you have a smaller layout and are willing to accept some deviations from prototype, logic rail might be an okay option. That brings me to the Atlas system, which we are currently implementing. Atlas seems to have gotten the message that many model railroaders would appreciate a signal system that is relatively easy to install and powerful enough to be prototypical, even on a large layout with long blocks of track. Before we get into installation, I'll just say, beware, the Atlas system is not cheap. 
In fact, when looking at components, it can seem deceptively cheap. A plug-and-play signal is in the $20 to $25 range, and of course you can get an adapter kit to use existing signals you already might have for about $3. But this is just the beginning. Next, you will need a signal control board for each signal head. So if you've got a double head signal, you need two boards for it. If you're doing a control point with four signals, which would be prototypical, you'll need four boards and space to mount them under your layout, preferably near the switch. The signal control boards are $20 or more each, or about $80 per switch on your layout. But we're not done yet, you also need a proprietary Atlas signal cable that converts from a signal connector to an Ethernet cable that plugs into the board. So now we're looking at about $80 for signals, $80 for control boards, and $30 to $40 in cables. That's about $200 to signal each control point on your layout. I have to say, I think Atlas could have done without the proprietary signal conversion cable and just had the signal cable attached directly to the signal control board. Yes, Ethernet cables are more robust, and there is an attachment for the older Atlas system as part of the pricey adapter, but that's getting into the weeds for this video. You will also need a block detector like the NCE BD20 for about $15 that will detect trains on one section of track. For our example, you would have three sections of track. Two main sections, one on each side of the switch, and a siding on one side of the switch. I didn't count the cost of the block detectors in my $200 figure, because comparing it to Digitrax, you would need block detectors for their system as well. I haven't done the math, but I suspect it makes more economic sense to go with the Digitrax system if you have Digitrax, and therefore Digitrax knowledge already. If you have a small layout and NCE, I think Atlas is probably the hands down winner. But if you have a large NCE layout like I do, you might find it would be cheaper in the long run to invest in Digitrax. But for me, the simplicity of the Atlas system and wanting to use plug and play Atlas signals was an overriding factor, especially knowing I was going to amortize the cost over a long time as I slowly built out the layout. Let's finish part one of this series talking about block detection. Then in part two, we'll dive into the actual installation. The block detector is the eyes of the system, and detectors like the BD-20 work by detecting a current drop when a locomotive, lighted passenger car, or resistor-equipped freight car are on any part of the block. This does require you to gap your rails when installing track, or going back later like I did and cutting the rails with a Dremel blade. You only need to gap the side of the rail that has the detector, or if you're like me and a bit OCD, you can do both. Just make sure you have enough power drops. I prefer Iowa scaled block detectors because they give you feedback on both occupied and unoccupied blocks right on the detector board, and they cost about the same. Both Iowa scaled and BD20s function the same with a ring that you feed a wire through from your detector block. I've never needed a second wrap of wire, but some people do. It's critical that the block detector is placed between your power district and the section to be detected. I made the rookie mistake at first of putting it through one power drop only and missing a few more drops down the line. That resulted in the loco being detected only when it was right over that power drop. Whoops. With your block detector correctly installed, simply test a loco or power draining car on the rails and the LEDs on the detector will show you what your signal will eventually report. If you're not getting the sensitivity you should, most detectors come with a small pot to change that sensitivity. Wiring is important and can get confusing quickly. I had previously run white and black power district feeders under my tracks with drops every few feet. When separating the power district into smaller blocks for signaling, I realized I would need to rewire to keep from confusing myself and making repairs in the future a nightmare. I used blue and yellow 14 gauge wire for the power districts, and then the existing black and white 18 gauge wire became the block wiring. Where these blocks connect to the power district bus is where the block detectors needed to go. The color coding really helped me keep wires straight, which I can't emphasize enough. Blue and yellow weren't being used anywhere else on the layout, so it made a lot of sense. One final consideration is the power for the signal system. Atlas suggests to create a 12 volt power bus just for the signal system, and I found out the hard way, this isn't really a suggestion. As we'll go into in the next section, the Atlas system seems to work by shorting normally green signal circuits with red ones. 
This means your block detector needs to be on the same 12 volt power supply as the signal system. Otherwise there is no signal to short. My layout is in several separated spaces and has LED strip lights overhead for its lighting. As a result, I have a bunch of these 12 volt power supplies spread around the layout. It's very handy to just pull power off one of these circuits if I want to light a structure, power components, or what have you. So a block detector way down the line from an Atlas control board must be on the same power supply. I found out this the hard way and had to go back and run a dedicated 12 volt power bus around the layout for the signals. Running this 12 volt bus around certain parts of the layout is going to be difficult for me. So I may try to drill some holes for wiring, but I think I would prefer to switch the signal system over to another power supply in a different room. That'll require a second block detector on one section of track. One to detect the block for the first Atlas power bus, and the other detector which will be part of the second Atlas power bus. I know most of you won't have this problem, but it illustrates you can't just hook stuff up willy-nilly and expect it to work. Thanks for watching part one. In part two, we'll go through the setup process of a four signal control point, which will be the most common application on most layouts. In the meantime, be well everyone. <laughs> All I managed to accomplish was get spit all over my phone!